and Robbie. Um, Bill's uh, the, the uh, vice chair and a bit of everything. He does all the work. And Robbie's um, rally. I just look good. Yeah, I should look good. <laughs> oh, you so do. Uh, well, we're going to keep, this is our number, our second one. We're going to keep it short and sweet. Um, we've got a little bit of stuff that takes a bit to digest, but it's, um, it's, it's pretty much fairly straightforward. So I think I will try. Bill's going to take over now. He's going to do his presentation. Um, and then we'll go through his. Then I've got a little bit about entering and leaving Australia. And then we'll have some questions. So if you can just hang on for the questions till the, the end. And we've got a roving mic here that when we do it, we'll, we'll wander around so that you can, the, uh, your dulcet tones can be there for posterity on the, on the camera. Um, for anybody that wants to have a look at this later. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys. So, um, I think the last time we spoke we talked very much about the, uh, the fun side of Bali and what a great experience it is and uh, all the opportunities it opens up. Um, but tonight I'm afraid we've got to talk about the hard work side of it and uh, that's all about uh, getting, to the, getting to the start line. So we've got 50 something votes that have um, expressed interest and so the focus now of the organising committee is we've got lots of votes interested. The question is now how do we help those votes get to the start line? So uh, that's, that's really where our focus is, uh, is now. Um, a couple of people have asked me what's the difference between the, uh, between the race and the rally, so I thought I'd start with that. Um, but before we talk about the difference, I'll just talk about what the common features of the race and the rally are, because at the end of the day we are one fleet of boats leaving Fremantle, or not even necessarily Fremantle, and, uh, and heading to Bali. So we're all facing the same challenge of about it's about a 1,500 mile um, uh, trip by the time you can take into account coming, coming around, the, around the coast. So that's a common feature. Um, mm -hmm. Safety, uh, race is cat one, rally is cat two. The differences between the two are important, and the, but, but they are, there's a lot more in common than is different. Um, of course, after you've got to Bali, there's a great opportunity to go cruising around Indonesia. And uh, the new tax laws in, in, in Indonesia means you can cruise for three years in Indonesia before you need to bring your boat back uh, without, uh, without paying any tax. Um, another great common feature is, look, there's friendships which get, get built um, through the Bali race, uh, be it in the uh, preparation work or the time at sea, which is going to last a lifetime. And the last common feature, of course, you know, we're all heading for a big party in Bali. That's what the yeah, that's what the goal is. Just in terms, though, back to the differences now. Um, look, obviously the race is a race, and so you start at a designated time, uh, one o'clock on the um, on the fifth of May, and uh, it's all conducted under the uh, under the racing rules. Uh, sorry, back to May. Back to May. Um, for the rally, look, it's pretty flexible. Uh, as long as you arrive in Bali in time for the party, um, <laughs> then you're welcome to leave early. And, uh, and, and no, I, it's a serious point because, you know, there's a beautiful bit of coast to cruise on, and uh, for some boats, they might prefer to leave a bit early, cruise up the coast, take it easy, because, to be honest, the weather is the worst in the southern part, so take that bit a bit easy and uh, cruise up the coast and then leave the, and then leave to go on to Bali. Uh, we're also in discussions about having a second start out of, out of Darwin, uh, again aimed to arrive at the same time in, uh, in, in, in Bali. Um, I mentioned safety is very much the same, but there are some important yeah. points. So the race is category one, um, with no exceptions. So we are bound by the racing rules um, or the safety requirements of Australian sailing, so there is zero flexibility on the, uh, for, the, for the race boats for Cap 1. Um, probably the, the biggest feature is, the, um, is around stability. Uh, stability requirements are higher for racing, 
and uh, that requires a boat to actually undertake a, an inclining test to actually measure the um, centre of gravity for, uh, for each boat. Um, the last thing I mention is um, it can be, uh, we're hoping to be able to run this using satellite or have the option to run satellite, uh, but we need to get an exception from Australian sailing to do that. On the rally side, as I said, it is not a race. So if you need a motor or you want a motor to try to maintain schedule, that's, that's fine. There will be a rally prize and there will be different factors taken into account, like how many fish did you catch and you know, what was the best reel you had at sea and, and how many hours you spent motoring. But look, it's there, it's for, it's for enjoyment. Um, the rally side is, is category two. Um, but that is slightly less uh, onerous. Uh, the key thing, because it's a rally, is that we do not need to comply with absolutely every precise detail of Category 2. So if a boat owner wants to propose an alternative, so they have an alternative suggestion to how to meet the requirements, then it's open for the, um, for the committee to, uh, to accept those. And so, so just as an example, and this one comes from Rob Thomas, um, so there's a requirement to have a trisol or to be able to reef the main to X percent. And the point Rob made, well, look, if it's a catch boat with a mizzen, then there's other combinations of sail which can give you the low sail area without necessarily having to have a trisail. So there's a little bit of flexibility um, on, um, on different ways of meeting the, uh, the same, same requirement. Um, the other point I'd make is that um, Satellite communication is fine for the rat on the rally side. That's, there's no ifs or buts about that. So, no need to buy an HF radio and go with all the cost of that. Um, you can definitely go with, uh, with satellite. So, anyway, that's a little bit about the um, differences between the race and the uh, and the rally. What I really want to get into is to say, okay, we're a year out now. Um, how do we get from where we are now to the uh, to the start line? And look. It's probably a low estimate. I reckon 80% of the work is getting to the start line. To be quite honest, the sail, once you get at the start line, is relatively straightforward. So getting the boat and getting the crew, <coughs> getting the skipper ready for the start line is where all the work is. Look, my suggestion of how to go about it is you need to understand what the requirements are. So study the document, whether it's race or rally, and then produce what I've called a gap analysis. So just say, where are we at the moment? Where do we need to get to? What are the gaps? How are we going to cover, how are we going to cover those gaps? Um, and then prioritizing those gaps, I'll come on to that. Um, the last point is, there's lots of resources around. So everybody, you know, we're not literally in the same boat, but we're very much in the same boat in terms of we've all got the same challenges. So talk to other folks that are going. Um, we will formalise the mentoring program, so each boat will be allocated to somebody who's done the, the, the um, race or the rally before to, uh, to talk to. You can contact myself or Mike, or when you be on the Bali Committee, and um, I put them last, not because they're not, to manage their workload is uh, obviously uh, Travis and uh, the folks in the on-water office. So there's plenty of resources to help you. Requirements. If you haven't seen this, um, it's downloadable from, a, from the Australian website. This is the Bible. This lays out the precise details of Category 1 and Category 2 safety. So I would encourage you to uh, download it and, uh, and, and read it. But in terms of the sequence, in terms of what you need to do for preparation, the most, the most fundamental question is, is stability. Because it's an absolute requirement for the race boats, it's obviously a requirement for the rally boats, and you need to understand that you're going to be able to meet the stability requirements, otherwise you don't want to start paying your money and doing, making all of your plans. So I put down number one is stability um, as the first thing uh, for each uh, skipper to check. Um, the second requirement, which is, and I'm going in order of difficulty, but not that stability is difficult, but it's, it's fundamental experience, the certain experience requirements which take time to, uh, to put together. Uh, training, training is generally pretty available, it's a bit of time and a bit of money. And the last one is equipment. 
And a lot of people focus on equipment because they've got to go away and buy a new one of these or a new one of those. But to be honest, the equipment's the easy part because it's just a matter of spending money and you can get all the equipment you need. So the other ones <coughs> higher up, it's, it's not necessarily money, it's a question of, uh, of, of, of time. So stability, um, I'll start with the, with the rally side. Um, key point on stability on the rally side, which will cover, I hope, the majority of boats, is um, ISO design category A. So any boat which has been built in the last probably 20 years, uh, any production boat, um, is most likely already certified to be ISO design category A. And if you have a piece of paper which says that, then you've ticked the box on, st on stability, and there's uh, nothing else to, uh, to, to, to worry about. Um, you don't achieve that, well there are other options that it's more complex, but um, I'm hoping the majority will meet that design category A. Uh, the last thing on the, on the, on the rally side, um, design category A is um, supposed to be is, is based on making a boat safe to sail in, um, in Force 10, which is I think about 45 plus knots, and uh, if you read the notice of rally, um, for the rally boats, there is an obligation to seek shelter if the forecast is greater than 40 knots, and that sort of ties in with um, with, with that ISO design category uh, design category A. Um, on the race side, um, I am told by um, by the experts the easiest way to get to pass stability for race is to get a no RCI certificate. Uh, if you already have an IRC certificate, it's only a few more measurements to move to an ORCI certificate. Um, so it's quite simple. Um, but then the key thing is, is the measurement of stability. Uh, and so that has to be done on a specific boat. You can't, you can't say, well, look, this boat is identical to that boat, so we'll use their stability results. It has to be done on each uh, individual boat, and it does actually require a, uh, a measurement. <coughs> One of the good news is that um, the coach we have here, uh, Tor, is a qualified naval architect and he's very familiar with um, doing stability on uh, commercial boats. And so what we hope to do is to try to coordinate the, uh, the stability measurements so we can, uh, we can get the gear here that we need and uh, we can put the boats through in, uh, in matches. At the end of the day, each boat's going to have to pay the cost for themselves. But uh, we hope if we can plan that a little bit, uh, we can uh, keep that uh, keep that cost down. <coughs> Experience um, actually really very similar between uh, between both uh, between both categories. Um, the fundamental requirement is for amongst the crew that 50 percent of the crew must have completed a race or the same category or uh, what is called an equivalent passage. Um, exactly what's rated as equivalent, I I'm not quite sure, but, um, uh, but it's, um, in my mind, something of very similar nature and duration as the, uh, as the race. Again, talking about um, on, on the rally side, um, look, the, the best way to get that experience or equivalent passage probably is to take part in one of the offshore events which are happening um, next year anyway. So, Fremantle to Geraldton, uh, there's a race, that's category two. Um, it's very open for rally boats to say, look, we'll come along, we're not gonna race, uh, we're just gonna cruise, uh, we'll, but we'll get the benefit of having um, a, a radio room that's keeping track of boats through the whole event. Uh, each boat will have a yellow brick tracker so they know, they know where they are, and so, uh, that's a great way of getting Category 2 experience, or alternatively is doing the return back from Geraldton. So there'll be a lot of boats that'll be looking for crew to help bring them come back from Geraldton, opportunity for skippers or crew to do the sail back from Geraldton, and then that will count as, a, as an equivalent, uh, equivalent passage. On the rally side, look, my biggest recommendation is, is experience sailing at night. Um, I was saying, to Bali, it's probably about 10 days, uh, and that means, you know, 10 nights, and at that time of year, probably about 50% darkness, 50% daylight. 
So just getting experience sailing at night is, uh, is, is, is really important. Um, on the race side, in a Category 1 or again equivalent passage, um, there have to be long offshore races. Um, there are very few Category 1 races around. Uh, Sydney Hobart is one of the, one of the few. Um, but people have got other opportunities that they can do um, uh, delivery trips, do returns from those long races, do delivery trips to the East Coast. There's other ways people can build up their experience for, uh, for the uh, Category 1. And uh, essentially, in my mind, Category 1 means like a multi-night passage. So it's not one night like a Geraldton, it's two, three nights, and that would uh, count as an equivalent passage. So experience, I put that as number two priority because you know, it doesn't happen overnight and uh, you have to plan and work out how you will build that experience. Training, look, uh, training is relatively straightforward. Um, there are three requirements from a training perspective. They're exactly the same, race or rally, sea survival, um, first aid and uh, VHF. Um, VHF, to be honest, you can do it on you can do it online for 50 bucks, I think. Um, the most important one is sea survival, and it's a really useful course. Um, it's uh, two days, and uh, Fremantle Sailing Club is now um, certified to run uh, uh, sea survival courses, and so uh, that should be. I think they run now a couple of evenings, uh, followed by a session on uh, on a Saturday. So. It's fairly easy to get that, but all I would say is don't leave it to the last minute because these courses book up, and if you leave it till the new year, then it will be quite hard to get a spot. So, just again, plan plan ahead. Uh, medical, um, I think it's senior first aid is the old name for it. I forgot what the new name for it is, but uh, doing medical courses are relatively straightforward. They're reasonably available, and uh, we can organise them at the club if we uh, if we need them. Of course, if you've got a medical person on the boat, then that, can, that obviously counts. So training, not too hard. Um, and probably the last one is, um, is equipment. Um, as I said, equipment really just comes down to money, to be quite honest. Uh, but there's a few things you can do to minimize the cost of, uh, of equipment. Um, the first thing, obviously, you can borrow it off other boats. You find a lot of people around have got stuff and they're happy to, uh, to lend it. Um, second hand, uh, look, you need to have, I, I can't recall the details, you need to have a storm chip. Um, you, if you haven't got a deep reef in your main, you need to have a trisel. But you can buy these things, you know, online pretty cheap. So I've got a trisel, it cost me 250 bucks from Sydney. And uh, it's got four boat names written on the bag. Probably never been used once. And uh, you know, it ticks the box. That's fine. That's it. so. You don't have to buy this stuff new. Um, a lot of stuff you can hire. So uh, PLBs you can hire, life rafts, um, satellite communication. You know, to hire a satellite phone is like fifteen dollars a day. Um, so um, not that expensive. A life raft, I think it, last time we were, had a life raft for a couple of months, it was $450. So a lot cheaper than actually going out and buying this stuff if you're only going to use it once. Um, but of course there are some stuff that you need to buy. You know, for example, it's a requirement now to go into Indonesia to have an um, AIS transponder, so not just receive, but will transmit as well. Um, and you, there's no option to hire it, you've got to buy one. All I would say is, need to allow enough time to get the thing installed and um, and get it tested because you'll find that post Christmas just about everybody is saying shit I need to get I need to get my rig replaced I need to get some shade covers I need to get some instruments installed and it's very hard it, it, you know there's only a limited supply of people to do this stuff so it, it, it ends up getting backed up so again just allow time uh, and the last one on the equipment there is if you look back to those sailing regulations, there is an equipment checklist. Um, again, I would encourage you to go back and do a sort of self-assessment, see where you are, do this, uh, do this gap analysis. So, look, I'll just say again, you know, there's 
this is the hard work part, to be perfectly honest. If you can get yourself to the start line, sailing the boat is pretty easy after that. So this is the bit which will exhaust you. Um, it's, it's going through meeting all these requirements, you know, plan and, you know, as I said, the, the Barney Committee's focus now is not, when, yeah, great, we can get some more boats, that'll be really good, but the focus now is how do we help you guys actually meet the requirements and get the experience and get the get ready for, uh, for, actually, uh, for actually starting. I'm happy to uh, take any questions before we move on to, uh, to Mike Simpson. Yep. Sorry, Pat. Uh, uh, the yacht truckers um, required right across the, both divisions. Um, the, are they hired sort of on a daily basis or whatever? And when we get the barley, um, is there provision that we we'll send them back on mass or where we hire from? Or uh, yeah, the part, of, the part of the entry fee is for the hire of the, uh, yeah. hire of the trackers. So you don't, the boats don't need to hire the trackers. That comes as part of the uh, entry arrangements. And uh, yeah, look, they will be available certainly for the race to, um, to or the running up to Bali. Um, and I think in the past, if boats have wanted to keep them for the return trip, so friends and family know where they are, then that can, uh, can be arranged. Otherwise, they're normally taken off the boats in Bali and, uh, sent, and uh, sent back. Sorry, Terry, yeah. Uh, uh, Travis, will you, uh, uh, Travis, uh, will you publish the uh, Sea Survival Safety Course dates, please? Yeah, the um, safety and safety oh. course dates will be on shortly. Um, currently with water temperatures, we're unable to run the course of the club. So um, come September, when waters warm up, there'll be courses booked right through until the start of Bali next year. Uh, when, when will the, uh, when will, when will we start doing the safety orders? Uh, oh, sorry, compliance orders. Look, to be honest, um, compliance audits can be done at any at any stage. We have quite a few auditors um, who are approved to uh, audit to this this category. Um, but as I've said, look, if you're at the stage where you're worried about, you know, an audit, um, a self audit will actually give you a, a lot of uh, a lot of the answers. And, um, and look, yeah, look, any any time basically. Sorry. Are there any time restrictions on how long ago your crew experience was? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, there's a qualifying passage that has to be done. Yeah, but otherwise, crew experience, no, look, if it's, I'm sure there's got to be some practical limit, but in reality, no, it's not. It doesn't have to be an end done anytime soon. Sea survival though, uh, I think sea survival courses are only valid for five years, so if you've gone past five years you can do a refresher, which is only half, half the day, half the time, half the cost. Uh, just looking at the rally section, with the um, stability side of things, if your boat was the, um, stable in 2013, is it still accepted now or do you have to have it re-measured? Look, I, 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 I would say stability requirements haven't changed, so I would say you'd be on for a, a winner there without without getting into, to, you know, I guess it comes down to the specifics of the boat, but there's no there's no change. Look, what, what we've done, it's been a very conscious decision to say, look, you know, as a club, you know, we are, you know, at the end of the day, this has been done under the Fremantle banner, and, uh, and if something goes wrong, then, you know, Free metal will be sailing club will be held accountable, but most importantly, we want people to be safe. So, we, you know, we have deliberately said, look, we're going to try and help bring the rally boats up to uh, up to category two. Um, but yeah, that's no different from the last one we did. We ran that was run right to category two as well. With the stability, if, if um, the boats qualified and there's no major changes, um, if you've got any doubts, give us the information. We'll have a look at it and give you some. Some advice, but if the if it's still current in the not not too distant past and there's no major major mods, it'll be fine. Thanks. Back to 
to the instability issue, can you point me to a list of design, both design standards, both designs that fit this category, I think, as well? Oh, look, I, I, firstly, I think if you've got a production boat, you should have somewhere in your documentation that, it's, that it is category A. Um, there are lists available um, on the um, um, IRC and the ORCI uh, website for standard designs, and it does specify to say whether they, what, what design category they are. So uh, you have to, I think you have to look, register and get a password, and then you can look at those lists. But yes, that information is available. There's something like 500 boats that have, are on those lists which meet design category A. Do you say it's a requirement for AIS in Indonesia or for the rel? Um, it, it, there's a trade-off. So Indonesia used to have this CATE system, which was very bureaucratic. You know what so well, anyway. So they used to have they used to have CATE was a requirement. So a bit like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, I think all done the same thing. They said we can get rid of all the paperwork as long as we know where you are. So AIS is a is an Indonesia requirement. Doesn't matter whether you're racing or running, it's an Indonesia requirement. So that's the trade-off. You don't have to do all the paperwork, but you, have, you must have an AIS transponder. And to be honest, look, the only time I've ever seen a ship alter course has been when we've had AIS on. So, you know, plenty of nav lights, whatever, they don't, they don't even see those. So um, AIS, they actually pick up. So I would recommend it. Because they don't have AIS. Uh, look, it varies. There's a lot of vessels up there don't know. There's a, and even barges and uh, some of the tugboats don't have them, but the big, the bigger ships do. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're sailing under the Australian Sailing Special Regulations, there's no um, RPLs, there's no recognised prior learning um, on the SSSC qualification. Um, unfortunately, the only course that matches through the special regs is the Australian Sailing Safety and Sea Survival course. So a professional course doesn't qualify? No. <laughs> Sorry, that's... And, and another question. Um, is, Stated the VHF requirement, not an HF. Um, sorry, I, I'm assuming that most boats will. Uh, I'm assuming if you if you're using HF, yes, you must have an HF license. Um, but I'm assuming that most boats will go with VHF and uh, satellite. But of course, if you've got an HF, yes, you must have an HF license. Yeah. Sorry, just just for clarity there, uh, if you have HF, you have to have a ship's HF license, and for VHF there is a class license that everybody gets for the ship, but you need to have a qualified uh, VHF operator on board, and there's a few different variations of that. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Uh, thanks, Terry. Yeah, you must have to be able to operate a VHF. You must have a VHF uh, <coughs> license, uh, be a licensed operator. You must have two licensed operators on the boat. And uh, the same if you've got HF, you must have two licensed operators on the, uh, on the, on the boat. Mikey. Our um, personal AIS, AIS um, locator beacons require, or is it just on the ship? No, look, um, the reality is, I'm saying, this is a pretty remote piece of water. Once you leave Northwest Cape and you head off to uh, Indonesia, um, there's not a lot out there. And so, as a sort of organising committee, we said, well, you know, to be perfectly honest, the PLB is going to be bloody useless um, out there. Um, you're not going to get that. By the time somebody gets out there to you, um, you know, you're talking hours and hours, and um, so look, we decided that uh, personal AIS, uh, it's net world sailing has now made it a requirement for category one, and I think maybe also for category two. It hasn't come into Australia, um, but uh, as an organising committee, and uh, to be honest, post um, finished there, we 
decided that given the remote locations where we're sailing, uh, that uh, personal AIS is a requirement for, um, for, for each person on the boat, as well as obviously you must have a set for the boat itself for, for each person. You can hire those as well. So um, the company in uh, Sydney is uh, offering those for hire, um, or they're to buy, they're a bit under about 280, I think now. Uh, with the personal AOS, they're getting smaller and smaller. This is one that's just uh, come in. Um, so, and this is under $300. Uh, and 72 hours. Yeah, 72 hours of, of transmission time. So, and as, as Bill said, we made a decision uh, based after the Finisterre, Finisterre tragedy, which uh, this, if this had worked correctly, um, it would have, probably wouldn't have had the same outcome. So, and as Bill said, it, it is, um, world sailing is, is going that way and we're usually 18 months behind before it gets into our, our system, so it will come anyway. So it, it's not a, not a waste of money by any stretch. run some form of radio sketch, but to be honest, we haven't got into that level yet exactly how, how that will be done. Um, I think it probably depends on how many boats are on HF and, and obviously will encourage boats to keep in touch with each other um, along the way. So there will be something, but details not, not yet decided. Yep. Okay, I've just got a couple of little things to squeeze in here. Um, we've got, so far we've had deposits from that. One full payment and a deposit for one boat. I'd encourage everybody to uh, to at least get the deposit in. Um, it's two hundred and fifty dollars. Gives us an idea of who's actually going to be on the start line. Um, if for some reason you need to pull out for whatever reason, we will um, we will refund a portion, holding a little bit for administrative costs. So you will get your money back. So. If you do, if you can pay it sooner rather than later, it would be terrific uh, because we've got our 50 odd expressions of interest, but we don't actually have any numbers yet. Um, and it, for planning, for long term planning, we just need it as soon as possible. Plus, you might win a barbecue. Yeah, just, just the only thing I just like to back up what Bill said. We've got uh, within this group, within previous competitors, we've got a huge amount of knowledge and, and uh, help out there if you need it. So if you're struggling a little bit or you think it's all too too hard, just talk to one of us. So we'll, and we have a mentoring system, which but we haven't had any uh, requests for assistance yet. So if you think you need some help, just ask us because we'll put you with somebody that's done it before or in the process of doing it and can answer a lot of the, a lot of the, the questions because it's not actually not that hard. Um, and so there is a hell of a lot of support within the within the fleet. Just with the qualifying passages and races, I mean the passages are fine, but I think uh, if you pencil into your calendar to do one of the one of the longer races, and the first one is obviously the Geraldton, um, they will be running a rally uh, section of that. Um, it qualifies you to do the Sydney Hobart, so it sure as hell qualifies us to go to, go to uh, Bali. Um, and yeah, well, that's, that's about it. Um, we'll, we'll slot into the uh, a fairly abridged version of how you're going to get there. Now, one of the things that you need, and it's up the top of your priority list uh, because of time, is if you don't already have one, you need an official number. And this is an Australian requirement um, if you're leading, leading Australia. Uh, it's, if, if you're going to a foreign port, if you're from a foreign port where you're coming into an Australian port, 
from a foreign port, you need it. Um, the registration has got there's two ways of doing it. You can get a full full on registration, which costs um, depending on the length of the vessel, but it costs a little bit, about fifteen hundred dollars. Or you can get a short one, uh, which is just for it's, it's set up just for races like this. Um, it's about depending on the I think it's about three hundred and thirty three hundred and fifty dollars for each direction. Um, it's got a, it does have a time time limit. I think it's about three months. Um, but it's it's very easy to find. All of this information is on the on the um, the website. Um, as I said, this I've got yeah, it's, it's, uh, you, the, the problem with getting the full on registration is you need to start off by submitting a, an application to register, and that takes 30 days. Um, so you have to, what it is, it's designed to make sure that no other that boat hasn't been registered before. Um, and that's, and, but a temporary pass is a little bit easier because it's, it's, um, it's a bit cheaper, and a lot of people have done the temporary pass. If, don't intend, if you just intend going to Bali and coming back again. Um, with the official number, it's a bit of a pain sometimes to find somewhere to put it. In my limited experience, uh, they give you these, these, uh, these really specific um, sizes and positions on the vessel. Uh, not too many people do that on a yacht. So, I mean, I know there's one yacht out there that's got plastic all over the side. Exactly as it says, as though it's a hundred thousand ton ship, but uh, it's generally a bulkhead, bulkhead plaque and, and somewhere in of truth on the vessel. Um, one of the other things that to put in the memory bank if you're applying for any of these registrations is that on the form, and I think I've got one here somewhere. Um, that's the, the application. I've got one here from my boat somewhere, that's not on there, but we, um, with your name, name of the vessel, you need some options. So they, they give you three, I think, three options. Um, so do a little bit of research, look for your name around the trap, see if there's some registered vessels, because it's on the, on the uh, AMSA website, there's a registration uh, list of names. If there's, a, in our case, um, there was, a couple of endorphins, so I put endorphin one, two, three, whatever, and we ended up with endorphin one. Um, it's 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 just for your paperwork, so it's not a not a big deal. Um, it is worth uh, once you have all of this information to hand that you you. It's very useful if you get a ship stamp made with this information on it. It saves saves a lot of guesswork down the track when you when you you've got some. You know, it's like official bits of paper, so it gives you something to stamp on the end of it. Uh, insurance, that's something that you need, which is obviously an individual thing. Um, but start talking to your insurers now, because there's been uh, a few problems at the 11th hour trying to get insurance to cover you for wandering around Indonesia. It's not anywhere near as difficult for rally boats as race boats. Um, but the, it's worth doing now, uh, especially if it's coming up for renewal. Um, a lot of the insurers have a, uh, you pay an additional amount as deemed necessary by them to cover you for that specific event um, or for the racing side of that event. But, but what's, what's happened now is with, with the, a lot of the, um, the claims in the last few years, that they're actually making it very difficult for race boats to get insured for for uh, expeditions like this. And we've got the actual personal, the personal insurance requirements in the NOR, so they're, they're um, self-explanatory. In the past, we've, uh, as far as the um, customs and quarantine visas, when we're leaving Australia, we've, we've done, with the help of um, the authorities, done block applications where possible. So, this requires um, information from competitors, and we will we'll give you some, some timelines a little bit further down the track, but it requires all of your crew information um, and quite a bit more. But 
it is simple, but once you've got it, um, and if you start to get that sort of information early, send it through to Travis as soon as you've got it. If you've got, as soon as you have your crew, your crew list sorted, send them to Travis so we can start uh, accumulating all that information. The, and all the basic stuff when you're wandering overseas with your with current passport, especially if you're wandering off, like a couple of people are there, make sure you're not going to run out of passport halfway through the trip. Um, your vaccinations, personal education, we, we, and, and letters to make sure that, from your doctor, making sure that um, when you come into a new country, you, you're not going to get arrested and thrown in the, in the slammer. Um, Post-bar, you need to start thinking about that a little bit as far as whether you come back to Australia or are going to wander around for a bit because obviously that makes a difference for visas and cruise visas and change of crew. With crew lists, just put everybody on it. It's way easier to pull them off than put them on. Um, and if you're short of a uh, passport number or something similar, it's almost impossible to get it at 11th hour. So just as soon as you've got your prospective crew sorted, Start accumulating, accumulating that information. And the old Q flag, I know there was um, one particular boat last time, so, uh, built one out of a pair of undies and they, on their way in because they didn't have one. Um, so, yeah. um, when arriving in Australia, um, it's coming back to Australia, it's, it's a fairly simple process that it's done every day of the week. At the moment, um, things change, but th this small car craft arrival report, it, it mm -hmm. gives you last point of, your point of entries, point of exits, um, crew lists, uh, all that information. What it, it pays to be ahead of the game with these and have these filled out, again, with everybody you think might be on the boat. What we've done, and I know a lot of people have done, it got suggested to me by, by a few people who have done it before, is you actually give it, make this copy, make a copy of it, give it to somebody who's close to email, close to, to um, a means of sending it, because if you, there's a, quite a stringent requirement to send it within a specific time frame. And um, I know Garth, uh, it costs Garth current about $7,000 and um, a lot of time in court uh, because he arrived in Darwin without um, without actually submitting the form. Uh, so, yeah. Well, on that, um, in Darwin before. Well, that was recently, but previously, you were allowed to submit this three months before you arrived. Yep. And then, but they must have a, your, your arrival date, but you must arrive, they must have the final application within 72 hours. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. And they were nothing but completely obliged. Yeah, well, so what we did, we just lodged it three months beforehand and get them changing it. They had not notice already. Yeah, we, we lodged ours about two or three weeks before and we we called them on the radio on the sat phone and sent them emails. Just because our, our date changes, <laughs> changes very regularly. Um, it's really, really simple, but you just have to plan it, be aware of it. And, Make multiple copies of all of these documents because nine, nine, seven, that way you can just leave them, give them to people, and it's it's easy done. Um, we will um, I put a note on there that we will have the relevant authorities um, coming down for a, probably about three months out from the event, so all of this all of this stuff will be um, sorted then. Um, obviously, we're, we're not experts on it. We've just done it a few times. Um, again, the the, um, the block block uh, applications for leaving and arriving um, are available if we can do it. I mean, if a few of you are coming back together, we can assist um, mm -hmm. if you're coming back together. So, but for departing departing here, it'll all be done out of at the club, the customer <coughs> here. 
stamp the passports, do all the, the uh, necessary stuff the morning of the race and rally. And when we've had a weather event in the past and we couldn't get away on time, it, they couldn't have been more helpful. The dates were just changed and even though we'd all cleared customs and we were here for another couple of days, they just came down and counted, pretty much counted heads on the boat and looked at photos and passports. So it's not that difficult. When we get to when we get to Bali, um, we will have an agent there to assist us to smooth the wrinkles out. Um, we actually pay part of your nomination fee goes to pay for these these people. Um, last time it was I think it was about 100 US we, we paid, but it was worth every cent. Of the um, they're on the dock. They're waiting there for us. They they liaise with the, the customers and quarantine authorities. In Bali, and it's it's really simple. They sometimes wander off with your passports, which is a little bit disconcerting, but uh, it's what they do all the time. Um, if we arrive after office hours, uh, if there's a lot of us, they might might come down and go through us. But generally, you've got to hang about until they, they surface in the morning. But uh, it makes for a good party on the beach. On the jetty, just can't leave the, leave the precinct. Um, just a really quick one with with maintenance. I know everybody's everybody knows that it's it's very important, but you really need to, as Bill said, with the um, with the planning for this event, make give it some considerable thought because and talk to the maintenance person or or somebody that's involved in this so that. You have an idea of what spares to take. Uh, everything up there is a little bit difficult, especially if you're going off, off um, cruising. On board. Um, as we are, we're going back to Darwin to to do a few events out of there. But you need to really, if it's a major problem you can't, you know, that you can't, you can't sort yourself. Within the fleet, we have lots of experience. So we've got sailmakers, there's one down there, shipwright down there, we've got mechanical people, we've got engineers, electrical people, riggers, all sorts of people within the fleet, doctors and very experienced cruising people. So if you do have a problem out there, don't be backward in contact, contacting some, one of us. Somebody will know something, know how to fix it. Um, we had a few, few phone calls last time <laughs> to sort a few mechanical issues out. Uh, and again, when we get there, if there are some issues, talk to us because you know we've, we've, a lot of people have got experience in getting things to remote places and, and, and repairing bits and pieces. So use use the group. Um, you need to give some consideration to fuel, obviously. Um, you all know best what what your boats use, but you really need to do some work on on quantities. And we know it's heavy, and we know. The race boats don't like to take it, and rally boats like to take lots of knots. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just yeah, if you think you need 20 litres, take 40. You know, it, it just it just goes without saying. And water, the same with water. Um, take take more than what you think what you think you need. Um, that's me done and dusted. Um, you got any any questions? Fire away. Say that if everybody can get their patience in the Indonesia. Yes. Don't lose your temper. Yelling doesn't get very fast in the Yeah. The last, the last event we had, everything was going really smoothly when we were departing because all the, the, uh, at the end of the event on the Saturday, I think it was, we started to work our customs uh, clearance out and boats that were going off. Most boats cleared, there was a few who just wanted, wanted poor clearance. Um, one, uh, one person thinking they were doing the right thing went off to the, the harbour office and tried to uh, push things along a little bit. Uh, so we were stuck there for another two days. Um, we had to put, put the shutters up and we had this crazy, crazy situation where we couldn't leave because we didn't have poor clearance, but the, we couldn't get poor clearance because we didn't have custom clearance. So, you know, it was just uh, playing around. But it's just really... Be mindful that they, they work a little bit differently to us, and that 
We've done it a few times, so we do know how to get around it, but we've got to be a, uh, a group. In previous years, a couple of people have not have hung about for a few weeks after the, after the event. And I know one particular case, he um, had to pay an awful lot of money to, to get out of the marina. Uh, so if we're together, we've got a united front. And we've got support from the Indonesian government, so if we're together, it's, it's not an issue. Yeah. Whenever, if you're on the marina and we're clearing and we're all clear together, you're going to have customs, you're going to have police, you're going to have quarantine there. Dress appropriately. Some of the things that happened that we had to keep them in some very skimpy clothing that were getting across <coughs> at the customs. <laughs> but, so just be aware of their culture. Don't be there. You know, in your little stubby shorts or your little singlet top with your boobs hanging out because that offends them and immediately the blinkers come down. The worst is if you see anything going and Phil and Mike are walking down, Phil and um, Mike are walking down with their arms around each other, know everything's gone to shit and I'll sort it out. Or Phil. But, <laughs> but that's, um, yeah, so just, I agree with Louise. Be aware, the customs things right now say that if you're cruising in Indonesia, we don't have to leave en masse. The actual fact is we did have to leave en masse because they just saw us as a group. And one boat went missing. That also cost us a day um, because he just wasn't leaving. So he went and parked his boat somewhere else. We had, took us a lot of phone calls to find that boat. Um, so just as we're going <coughs> forward, but we are this time going to have somebody, probably Travis or Caroline or someone, sitting there doing it all for us. You don't have to learn Bahasa. No. You just have to learn the culture. Yeah. Well, just so, respect the culture. So, so Travis, that was one of my points, was that there will be an FSC rep there. But also on fuel, um, we, we actually had to pump our fuel tanks out with the crap fuel that we got up there last time. So um, I, I don't know how you really guard for that except for uh, using some of the, the pre-filtered type funnels that you can use. But you have to uh, just be aware that you can get some, some terrible fuel. It, one of the things we did was we got the, got the fuel, tried to get the fuel from servos as well. And it's uh, very interesting, you know, two jerry cans at a time and one a motorbike going <laughs> but but it can be done and as Phil said if you if you've got you need good filtration on the boat so it's it's uh, really look at that talk to your mechanical provider about that and just make sure you have a really good quality and if you can can filter the stuff well the other thing that you do is just take a sample of it you know if, if you're getting it from a barge or, or out of, off the side of the street just pour a little bit, bit out and have a look at it uh, because often, you know, sometimes it, it looks a bit ordinary, but it's, it's actually quite plain. Um, yeah, so that's, thanks for Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, when's the presentation on? Is that been organised yet? Or date? Yeah, that'll, that'll be on the, the Saturday night, um, a couple of weeks after we leave. Oh, fair enough. So you've got two weeks. You've got two weeks. I mean, if you, if you both, if you, as Bill said, if you both, you don't think you're going to make it in the time frame, um, the yellow brick trackers we made provided in plenty of time for you to leave, so a week earlier if you want to. If you want to depart from a, a port further north, um, sort of Exmouth or anyone that has port clearance or, or um, anywhere up there yet, Dan, yeah. feel free and we'll, we'll help you. You'll be part of the part of the group um, and uh, and you will have a yellow brick so you'll be, be part of it. But as long as you get there for the party, that's my thing. And we're aiming on clearing everyone on Monday. So the party is going to be on Saturday night. The Monday is when we're aiming yeah. on... We'll be trying to clear, clear as a group on Monday. Yeah. One of the things with clearing too, which I think I mentioned last time, is, and again going from my experience having done a couple of these, is, is once you've cleared, as long as you don't stop anywhere for a ridiculous length of time, we weren't bothered at all. I mean, we, we took um, about four weeks, three weeks to get back to Darwin. Um, 
day sailing most of the time, a little bit of day sailing, but and we stayed we stayed in a couple of ports for two days. Um, but as long as you're not there for a week, um, nobody seems to bother you too much. And I've heard that from lots of people. They they're really trying to encourage us to use the place. So it's not just because you've cleared out of, out of um, Bali um, doesn't mean you have to rush back. You can you can sail back at your leisure. Well, from memory, we had to clear Bali. The rest of Indonesia. Yeah. 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 So just clearing doesn't mean that you're sailing to Singapore or something like that. Yeah, yeah it's clearing that's, means yeah. you're leaving yeah. the actual bar. Yeah, we're leaving the port. Indonesia yeah. permits, we yeah. still had to clear. Yeah. Yeah. Except Bill somehow got missed out here to make it way enough to go. But he waved goodbye to all the rest of us. Yeah. The, the, yeah. It's a port, there's a port clearance and a a um, customs clearance, so and they're different. So if you're in a major port, you need to get permission to leave the port. I mean, it's a bit weird because so I mean we used our boat to finish most of the boats, so we, we left the port about a dozen times, but, but and we weren't clear the quiz. So yeah, but to do it correctly, there is port clearance and a customs clearance. If you're going to leave your boat there, well, you do your port clearance and uh, wander back. Yes. Just on your visas, when you your boat gets a visa for three years or whatever, it's going to stay in Indonesia. We, if you get your extended visa, which allows you to be there in th for three months, be aware if one of you leaves, because I know Bill had to leave and Phil left, that you go out of sea. So when you come back in, you have you're not back on your 90-day visa. You're back on a 28-day visa, and every two weeks you have to go and renew your visa. So I know Phil and I, and Pauline and Bill, we spent in every three weeks a week in a port waiting for one or the other of us to leave the port to to get a renewal visa. And there's only certain places you can go. So if you're going in on the 90 days, be very aware of when one of you leaves, you go out of sick, and you're going to spend half. One week in two, trying to renew the other person's visa. So that's just something to be a bit aware of. And, and I mean, we're still, you know, eleven months <coughs> out, but and things may may change. So the information we're giving you is the information we have now and what we've got from group experience. So things may change a little bit, but uh, so we just need to be aware of that. Um, if you have any more questions. I'll just let you know, Jerry and I've just come back from Vanilla Harbour and they have painted and they have huge toilet. And we went over to Lombok. Well, the toilet works. Yes, toilet works. <laughs> 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 a shower? A shower? A couple of miles? You might as well stay in. No, it's like a two hour thing. Are you still there? Yeah. And then we went over to Lombok and checked out Killing Me came back, we did a recce visit to where we, we, we would we leave the boat in the surrounds. So we went to um, Manoa Harbour and it has been refreshed. Louis said a 2 out of 10, it used to be 0 out of 10, so it's, uh, the toilet used to be that deep in, in all the sort of muck, but now it's clean and tiled. Uh, the same staff there and they put a few improvements. Uh, there was, uh, there were only about three boats there. That's one option for leaving your boat or staying in the surrounds. Uh, Surrogate Harbour's around the corner where a lot of cruisers leave their boat if you're cruising and that's on an on a anchor or a mooring of variable quality and it's supposed to be safe for about five bucks a day so that's a cheap option or you can go across the Lombok, there's a couple options there and we went across to the new brand new marina at Killy Good Day uh, reported as the most expensive of the lot but it's a brand new floating marina takes about 60 boats, stern two, they've got a, a floating uh, Collect the jetty and then stern to and it's got desalinated water, 240 volts and a restaurant and swimming pool. So, uh, if, if you were going to stay in that area for a long term, that would be a very good option. 
Uh, but if you wish on a park for a few days, but that'll work as good as anything. Thank, thank you. So just just to cap off, if you need help, talk to us. We don't want to scare anybody away. We want to make it easy, and we're here to help. Thank you.